good morning everybody it's time for another uh programming challenge uh okay so here's what i got today it says good morning here's your coding interview prompt for today this prompt was asked by uber implement a 2d iterator class it will be initialized with an array with an array of arrays should be imp and should implement the following methods next returns the next element in the in the array of arrays if there are no more elements raises an exception has next returns whether or not the iterator still has elements left. For example, given the inputs uh, one, well, it's okay, I'm not gonna fully read it out, but, like I'm not gonna read all the brackets, but you guys can see it here. So it goes like one, two, three, four, five, six, right? With, you know, in, interspersed in inner arrays in, in a particular way. It says calling next repeatedly should output one, two, three, four, five, six. Do not use flatten or otherwise clone the arrays. Some of the arrays can be empty. Okay, so this is a pretty straightforward um, problem, I think, and and it's something that something you do have to uh, deal with in real life sometimes. Like I, I think I've I've had situations where um, I had some sort of data structure, not necessarily an array of arrays, but like some data structure um, where I wanted to iterate over the content of that data structure, but um, but it did not implement the iterable. Uh, interface and and so you just you you create like a wrapper object right that knows how to um iterate over over that so uh it, it sounds like we should not um it doesn't say that we should not mutate the array it just says don't flatten or clone the arrays but i probably don't want to mutate them so i probably want to have like um what's it called like like I, I want to not touch the arrays basically so like i have to track indices or something like that okay so let's uh, should we do some pseudocode about it like i feel like it's kind of straightforward right like basically you want two indices right you want the the outer index and the inner index is what i'm i'm thinking the outer index says um like this is oops this is index zero, this is index one, and, and so on. And the idea is uh, you keep incrementing the inner index. So this is inner index. When outer index is zero, meaning we're looking at this subarray, and inner index is zero, it means we're looking at this element. When you say uh, has next, I, I say, yeah, there is a next element. And then we call next, I turn one, and then increment the inner array. Um, the, the tricky thing may be the empty array, but we'll get to that in a moment. So then when I say, okay, give me the next one here, I'm going to increment, I'm going to return two, and then I'm going to try to in, increment the inner index, but then I'm going to notice that that's past the end of the array. So then I set inner index back to zero, and then I increment the outer index, um, which gives me this object. You say next, I return three, and then in, try to increment the inner index, but I see that's past the array. So then I set, outer, uh, I set inner index to zero, I increment outer index, I know that this is still outside uh, past the energy array. So I set inner index to zero again, I guess. I, maybe that's not necessary. I don't know. Depends on the structure of our algorithm. What's simpler? Like whether to set the inner index to zero again or, or, or skip that part. Then increment outer index and we end up here. Okay, so let's say I get to here. I return six. I try to increment the inner index. Um, see that's past the end array so i set inner index to zero i increment outer index and that's past the end of the outer array um and then maybe like we might need a boolean flag but we might not need the boolean flag right where we where we say like at the end is we set that to true like it was false before up into here and then we say true and then if you call next i raise an exception if you do has next i say uh false basically so okay, so I think pseudocode is pretty straightforward. So let's let's figure out what language we're gonna implement this in. <laughs> Basic, oh Colin. Colin's gonna be easy. Come on, come on. No, 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 no. But should we do Colin? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one more time. <laughs> and if it's Colin again, we'll do Colin. But like, Col I'm I'm really good at Colin, and this is an easy problem. Just... <laughs>
No, that's a, I'm pretty decent at JavaScript up, so what's... I feel like I'm cheating, but I don't want to cheat. To, like, I'm trying to cheat to make it harder, but I feel like if I do it too much, the viewers are going to think I'm cheating to make it easier or something like that. I say, well, what? So this is the easy problem to implement in both Kotlin and JavaScript. How about that? That sounds like a good compromise, right? Also, um, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I said I'm really good at Kotlin, but I'm usually, like, I'm good at Kotlin when I have the IDE to help me. I don't know how good I am without the IDE. Uh... What do I call this? 2D iterator. Let's call it that. Um, okay. So actually, let's do it in Sublime Text. I don't know. I don't want to do it in um, in Vim. And by the way, last episode, I, I mentioned how um, there was a license. Like, I didn't have a license because I didn't renew the license. I, I previously purchased Sublime Text, but then my license expired. But you see here, it says remove license now. And that's because I have purchased a new license. All right, so it was a 2D array. Okay, so... Um... 2D hitter. Are you, yeah, so I mentioned I, I usually write Kotlin in uh, in an IDE, so I'm going to do it in Sublime Text now. It's going to make it a little bit more difficult, but hopefully it's fine. It's going to be like an array of, of what? Of anything? Should be of anything, right? It doesn't really matter. So how do I do generics in, in Kotlin again? Is it like this? Uh, and then it has a next method, right? Oops. And that has next method. Let's check if this compiles. Uh, how do I compile Kotlin actually? Colin C, I guess, right? Do I not have Colin C? Hmm. Okay, we might. Let me let me just Google real quick. I thought it was Colin C to compile. Oh, Colin at command line. Yeah, this Kotlin C. What happened? I clearly did this before. Because I have the... Because uh... <laughs> I did like a test where I tried to compile the... Okay, whatever. Let's, let's just use IntelliJ. It's... It's becoming too much of a, a hassle to try to figure out all this stuff. I don't remember what my last project was that I had in here. Hopefully it's nothing. Oh yeah, this is um, a machine learning thing to help me figure out what type of video game Steph likes to play. Actually, let's just use this project. Um, I don't want to create a whole new IntelliJ project, so I'm just going to Just gonna create like a, a file in here and we'll, we'll use that file. To the iter. So I said it was something like this, right? And then I said, um, so this is not the syntax. So angle brackets. Looks like it's angle brackets. I guess square brackets must be scala syntax. Yeah. Print line. Hello world. Hang on, let me adjust my mic for a bit. Oops. 
Okay. Um, just double check that we can compile and run all of this. And meanwhile, while that compiles, I'm going to say, so we have a, a next function and then a uh, has next function. I don't know, <laughs> maybe I should have done this one because I guess I have like some like machine learning library type stuff going on in there. But okay, so let's assume this that that will compile. Let me bring up the the uh, the spec again. Okay, so let's use this example. Is there, create, is there an array literal in uh, in Kotlin? Actually, maybe it's just this. Maybe I can just Collection literals outside of annotation. Okay. I don't work with um with uh what's it called arrays much in, in Kotlin. Usually you work with the collect collections type. That's the size of the array. How do I make an array literal? Or should I just do a list? Oh. Is there an array of? Oh, there is. Okay, so that's probably how you do it. Oops, I have unbalanced parentheses in here somewhere. Misspelled array also. Okay, I think that matches the... Nope. Okay, that's good. And then I pass in this here. Oh, I got the generics wrong. It should be like this. Okay, cool. And then insert that to the iter as oh not not to the iter, but the thing that's under test. That has next, insert that next equals one. Two, three, four, five, six, and then insert false. Um, not search, but There it goes. There's our test case. And right now it's probably going to fail with a to-do. 
I run it. <laughs> Is it really going to take this long? No, there we go. Perfect. Okay, so as we mentioned, we're going to have two um, in the seas. And then let's see. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna want a, a second test case. Let me think about how to implement that. Because what I want as a test case is I want a, a test case where the first entry is empty. So I can just do that by doing this. Yeah, I can put that in here probably. That's probably easier. And actually, I probably don't even need to make these functions. I can. I, I wish there was something like um, immediately invocable function expressions in Kotlin. The closest that I can think of is doing something like this. Running a let on unit or, you know, anything like a unit that run, unit that let, unit dot. Whatever. But OK, so. Would I okay? So I want to say has next is gonna return false if um, oh this needs to be a val. If array dot size is less than less than or equal to outer index. Um, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Now if we run it, it should, uh, it should fail for to do on the next instead of on the, um, instead of on the, uh, as next. Yep. Okay. So what do we do to return a value? We return. This is just a return value. Then we increment. Does Colin have this operator? I guess it does. I'm going to make it like this, so. If inner index is no okay so if the array the inner array dot size is smaller or equal to inner index then we're gonna reset our exit to zero and then we're gonna do outer index increment outer index um and then now oh you know the other test case we need to do <laughs> this is getting fun the other test case we need to do is if we have a bunch of DRAs here let me put a couple in here also. Let's 
And then let me try making sure we handle a bunch of empty arrays in a row. I think like just as you get experience of programming, you, you have a intuition for what are the scenarios that are likely to trigger bugs. So that's why I have this sense of like, okay, we're, this is where we're going to have a bug. This is where we're going to have a bug. And so I write test cases that specifically target those bugs. Okay, so what was I doing here? So while this, we increment the outer index. And let me move this to a helper function now. Make this function private. I did say I need to do a check, like I need to do an if here, I was going to do if the outer index is past the end or something like that, we throw an exception, but we don't necessarily throw an exception. We only like, because once we do find next element, we might increment past the end of the array and we don't throw an exception at that point because the user might still call has next, which should succeed. It's only here. If they call next and we're past the end of the array, we should throw an exception. But like, because of Kotlin, this will throw an exception automatically, right? If you index past the end of the array. So we, we don't ever have to explicitly code the check here however we do need to code the check here um or do we let me think if this well ray dot size plus and equal to outer index and then we just keep in okay i think that's that might be it then hmm. let's see if this works index out of bounds zero for this are we in the first array still okay we're trying to get four okay so we did not handle the empty array. that's weird i thought this would handle the empty array Hmm. Let's put a debugging statement here. So we're at zero, zero, then we say move to zero, one, right? Then one, zero, and two. Why did we break out of this array? I'll, this, okay, this has size zero. Inner index should have been zero. Outer index is two. Shouldn't it have kept looping? Why did it exit the loop here? I'm, I'm confused. So the array dot size is like one, two, three, four. So this is four less than... Oh, I have to do it the other way, I guess. No, no, this is right. No, it's not right. It's not right. I do have to do it the other way. So in there, two, four, and then... Two size is gonna be zero through yeah, okay. I think I got now. Test case one pass, nice. Okay, then for test case two. What is this?
Oh, did I put the word test case one over and over again? Oops. So I guess test case one and two pass. Actually, you know what that makes me think? We can make, we can do our at uh, ad hoc. And I ride the example. Test case. Uh, this is, or it, it. This is what this is um raise in the middle this is gonna be um the raise at the start the raise at the end and what I could have done also is I can wrap the whole thing in a try. And then we throw this exception. I said I'll need to close here. So yeah, I'm doing a poor man's testing framework. <laughs> oh, I forgot that I don't need to close here. So now run it again. Empty arrays at search shell. Yeah, that's the one I expected to fail. Okay. And that's because of the init here that we didn't handle here. So we say, so when you start, we check, we just have a special case where if the, the first array is empty. Um, if r zero size is zero, Then, where's empty? Sure, why not? Then just find the next element. Oh, and there's one more test case I want to do then after this. Here, let's start playing it. Every test pass? Okay, cool. And then completely empty. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this even more fancy. Just because I feel like we're finishing on pretty quick time. How much? Yeah, we're about half an hour in. I usually want these videos to be about an hour. on, um, But... Um, I'm writing my little micro test framework.
This might be me over engineering. In fact, it almost definitely is me over engineering. <laughs> For an interview question, it probably isn't worth doing this. Like, I, I might say, oh, I would do this and then, you know, like I'm on the whiteboard or something like that. I said, I, I would do this and then I don't actually do it. If this were a real code base, um, well, first of all, if this were a real code base, I would use a real testing framework, right? But let's say for some reason we couldn't, like maybe there's some sort of special, special circumstance that prevents us from using a real framework. Like maybe we're in a, like we don't have access to Maven or something like that, you know, so we can't download the dependencies. Then, then if then I would do this because, like, I think this makes it more maintainable, right? If someone wants to add more test cases in the future. Um, so what I want here is if you do this then right off the bat you say has next empty and if you try to do next it should have thrown an exception and we have a different test case which is nested empty and that's if we have something like this so both of these should just say yeah it's empty and then throw an exception if you call next Okay, so let's run this. Let's see if it works out outside the box. I'm not sure if it will or not. I think it might. No, it doesn't. Oh, right. Okay, so if... <laughs> so there, yeah, so there's a special case to the special case. If array is empty... But if the outer array is not empty but the inner array is empty what's this oh wait, is there an is not empty okay then we try to find the next element otherwise we're just empty from the start yeah that's it okay so I think we're we're basically done here. Um, unless there's some sort of edge case that I haven't thought about, but I feel like I, I've I've thought of all of them. Uh, let me go back to the the question here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we satisfied this. We satisfied this, I believe. Do not flatten yet. We did that. Okay. Yeah, I think that does it. Um, I don't think it's it's super worth doing this again in JavaScript because it's just going to be like JavaScript and, and Kotlin are both like, you know, descendants of the C language. So the solutions are going to be pretty similar. I mean, maybe if we did something, what, what would like if, if we did it in Haskell or Camel or something like that, then it might be significantly different. But we didn't get those on, on the, the language wheel, so we're not going to do those. Um, so this question uh, at first when I when I read it, it was like yeah this is easy and then I but I think now it's more interesting because I, I I I see what the the goal like from the uh, perspective of the interviewer like implementing it is is like whatever like if it's a, it's a low bar if you can't even implement it then then you know it depends on on what level you're hiring for if you're hiring for a junior position then maybe you know. As the interviewer, I'd say, okay, like, you know, if I give a little bit of hint, a little bit of guidance, and they f eventually get it, then that's fine for a junior. If you're doing for a more senior position and you can't implement it, then, that, then that's a no hire for me. But, but the, so implementing it is the lower bar. But then the question is, did you think of all the uh, edge cases, right? Because, like, I got surprised by what the edge cases were. Um, I got surprised by the, the completely empty array, for example. And so if I were an inter interviewer giving this question, I would like, you know, ahead of time, come up with all the edge cases and then check, does the candidate um, think of the edge cases and do they handle them? The thing is, like, usually when, when you're doing an interview, well, I don't know if I want to say usually, but it's it's not unusual <laughs> when you're doing uh, an interview, uh, a coding interview like this, that you have to write the um, the... The, the code on the whiteboard instead of in an IDE. So you don't actually get to run your unit test. Like you can, as a candidate, you can describe like, here's the unit tests I would do to, to the interviewer, but you don't get to actually run them because you don't have access to an IDE. You just, you're just using a whiteboard. Um, 
if if the interviewer is using it an IDE, then I would expect them to you know write the unit test. I would, if if they're using an IDE, the IDE is helping them, and so me as the interviewer, I would help them less, right? I would watch. I would just see like, do they come up with the the right test cases? Like, do they even unit test at all? Because I know some candidates they'll just write a solution and say, okay, I think I'm done. And they miss some edge cases and, and it's wrong. And then like, you know, that's, that's, you would lose a few points for doing that. Um, and then as you might my hint at them, it's like, okay, did you think of all, you know, the, uh, uh, the how would you test this, you know, and, th and questions like that, leading questions to hint to the candidate that they should, you know, maybe write some unit tests. Um, and then if they write the unit tests, like, you know, I'm, as the interviewer, I'm watching them as, okay, did they, did they think of all the edge cases, you know, and, 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 and if they miss one, I might, you know, ask them questions like, okay, do you think you've covered all the edge cases, you know, and, and like, you know, like gently prod them towards, um, the, the solution and, and basically as an interviewer, you're trying to gauge how much help did you need to give the candidate to figure out like, you know, are they, are they a senior developer or are they a junior developer or are they a no hire? Um, that's with the ID. If it, if it's on the whiteboard, completely different story. So on the whiteboard, they don't get to run unit tests, right? So if so, they they write out the algorithm on the whiteboard, and then I, and then I'm observing. Do they think to to do tests? Um, if they do, that's bonus points. If they don't, then I might again. I probably was like, so what what sort of tests? You know, how would you test this? And then so then they might describe either in words or or drawing on the whiteboard. Like you know, here are the unit tests I would do. And then again, as the interviewer, I would observe, do these look complete or not, right? And because as the interviewer, I've already prepared this ahead of time, I already know what all the edge cases are and what and what the likely bugs are. What, when, during the earlier part, when the candidate was writing out, you know, the algorithm that they would use, like here's the code I would write, I would, while observing them, I would be, tr I would be running my, all the test cases that I know of, like in my mind, right? And I would see like, oh, they forgot to handle multiple empty arrays in the middle or, or something like that. Um, so I just keep that in the back of my mind. And then when we get to the part where I say, okay, you know, like, would, you know, what unit test would you write or whatever? And, and they show me the list of unit tests. Um, I, I should at that, as the, can, as the uh, interviewer, sorry, I should at that point already know which tests are going to fail, right? And so since they don't have access to an ID, they're only working on the whiteboard, I would act, at, as a proxy of the, of the ID for them. Like they write, they, they say, here are the tests I would do, and and I'm the interviewer, so I already know which tests are gonna fail, so I would tell them, okay, so you know, you're gonna run these, you would write these tests, but I think this test would fail. And then I would sort of leave it like, like that to see how they respond, right? Because what, what I'm hoping for, and, and if they don't do this, I'll just guide them towards it. What I'm hoping for, the, when I tell them this test would fail, they would step through, they would run that test case in their mind, right? They would play the act as the compiler or whatever and, and run that test case through code and see where does it fail. Um, or if it doesn't, like if they just, just sort of blank out, like, like, cause the thing is, I, I know you, people get nervous, right? During, during interviews. So if I just say like, oh, I think this test would fail. And it looks like they're like in this panic mode, you know, they're like, oh God, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fail the interview. I'm gonna lose my job or whatever. I'll try to calm them down. I'll try to reassure them. It's like, okay, so let's let's walk through. Let's see, you know, like what what happens. Um, let me get one of my test cases as an example. Yeah, let's say they, they have this as they say I would write this unit test, I, and I say, oh well, I think this test case would fail, and they say, okay, so let's walk through what happens. You know, you're, you're, so what, would it return one at the first thing when you walk through, and then you do this and you do this, and then uh, hopefully then they're like, oh yeah, you know, this is. It will fail because of whatever. I don't know, fix your code and so on. So I imagine that's that's how... I think that's the intent. Like, whoever designed this interview question, I think that's how they intend the interview to go. The uh, Just solving a problem, like writing code, I mean, write, write some code to, to solve a problem is the first step. And it's and it's the low bar, and then the, the higher bar is okay. So what are your testing? What's your um, what's your unit tests? What are your um, do you cover all the edge cases and so on? So yeah, the question a little bit more interesting than I thought. I thought it was really easy, but actually because of the unit tests and the edge case stuff, it's a little bit more in depth. Um, otherwise, yeah, I don't think there's much more to say about that. I mean, running time, I so 
it's a stereotype, right? Every time you do a, a computer programming interview question, you write your solution and everyone's like, okay, what's a running time and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's got to be linear, right? Because we're basically just, we're iterating over all, all of these once. So linear time, uh, constant memory in our case. Let me just double check that, right? We, we, the only memory we allocate is two, two integers. Yeah, these two. The array is already is part of the input, so it doesn't count um, as memory that we allocate. We allocate two integers, and that's it. So constant, constant space, uh, linear time. Yeah, I guess that's it. So thank you everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope this was insightful for you, for you guys. Uh, keep practicing your coding, keep learning, and, and have fun.